Mr. Carlos Sarte is a senior researcher of core research security technologies, and Mr. Javier Buroni is again also a senior developer of core impact from core security technologies. Without further delay, allow please do join me in welcoming both gentlemen. Well, thank you. Uh, well, he's Carlos. My name is Javier. Uh, we work for Core Security, and we are talking about how to use neural network to improve operating system detection. So, okay. well, we will split. This talk in five parts. First, we are going to talk about. We are going to have a brief introduction into the operating system detection. Well, we have OS identification, OS detection, and OS fingerprints. All these words refer to the same idea the idea of remotely identifying the operating system. So this is done sending test packets and then analyzing the response. And we think that it's a crucial step in the penetration testing process. If we can think in generation of operating system detection tools, we have at least two generations. The first one analyzes differences between TCP IP stack implementation, and the second one moves one layer higher to the application layer and try to determine the Windows version or edition using application data. Well, most of the operating system tool, operating system fingerprint tool, use variation of best fit algorithm. This will not work in non-standard situation and also it has some inability to extract key elements from the data. So our proposal is to focus on the technique and on the technique used to analyze the data and not in the data itself. And to do so, we have implemented tools using neural network, and we have successfully integrated those tools into Core Impact, which is a commercial product. So now we are going to talk about DC RPC endpoint mapper and how to use it to detect the Windows version and edition. Well, by sending RPC carries to a host 435, you can determine which services or program are registered. This response include a universal unique identifier, annotated name, a protocol. We will use this information. Here we have a sample response from a Windows 2000 host. And we will use this information to determine the operating system. So we think that it's possible to distinguish, like, distinguish Windows version using this data. And also we think there are some functions that maps the endpoint data to Windows version and edition. And we want to model this function using neural network. So if we want to use neural network, we have to respond some design issues like what kind of neural network do we use? We will use a multi-layer perceptron neural network, but we can use a cohonic neural network at the line, etc. Then we have to think how are the neurons organized if all the neurons are connected to each other, etc. Then we have to map the endpoint combination to something useful for the neural network. And finally, we have to train the network. Well, here we have a draft of the network used by the DC RPC endpoint mapper. First, we have an input layer. Then we have, uh, in the middle, we have a hidden layer. And finally, in the bottom, we have an output layer. We see that all the neurons are connected to the neurons in the layer below. Well, this topology, we have, in this topology, we have 413 neurons in the input layer. That means that we have one neuron for each ID 
and also we have one neuron for each endpoint. In that way, we can still get in some information if we don't know the endpoint, but we know the ID. Then we have one hidden neuron layer with 42 neurons. Well, the amount of neuron in this layer is a trial error process, so we can choose some funny numbers. Um, finally, we have 25 neurons in the output layer. Uh, this number, to reach this number, we have to think in what do, you, do we want. We want to know which operating system is, which version, and which service pack. So we have one neuron for each Windows version, and also we have one neuron for each edition and service pack. In that way, errors in one dimension, for instance the service pack, do not alter errors in other dimension, which can be the edition. So, what is a perceptron? As we see, there are all the neurons in the up layer are connected to the neuron in the layer below. Well, the neuron transfers its energy to the, left, to the other neuron, and the amount of energy transferred depends on the relation between those two neurons. And this relation is called weight. Well, once all the energy is in the neuron, some activation function is applied, and the output is the neuron output, which will be provided to the bottom. So training of the network is finding the way for each neuron that minimizes the error. We will use pack propagation for the training. So we have one expected output and one output, actual output. We will use um, the first derivative of the activation function and we will compute some delta value. Then we will back propagate from bottom to the top this delta value. Okay. So once we have the delta value, we will change the weights, the relation between the neurons using an iterative process and the new weights we will change it in a way that include, includes the delta value, some parameter called, called learning rate, which is like the speed to learn new knowledge, and the momentum, which is the how long a uh, memory is kept in mind. So the, the neural network can be seen as a, as a function which, given an input, calculates uh, an output. And uh, in fact, it's a differentiable function. So we can calculate the, the partial derivatives uh, respect to the, to the weights. And uh, the back propagation algorithm uh, calculates those partial derivatives. And then we move in the direction of the gradient, which is uh, where the, the error goes uh, faster down. And, uh, and that's, con that's the training, you know? moving around this weight space, finding the, the minimum of the error. And uh, well, one generation will consist in recalculating the weights for each input output that we have in our data set. And the complete training requires doing that uh, a lot of time because it's a more or less random process. So uh, we have to do it several times until we find the, the right direction and we found those, those minimums. So uh, for example, here we took like 10,000 generations, and uh, each time that uh, you train the network, it will take a uh, different number of generations, but it's more or less this. So the training takes quite a lot of time, and, uh, and it's uh, quite a manual process to design the topology and uh, see if it gives better results. And uh, well, another characteristic of the training is that the inputs are reordered randomly, so they don't affect uh, 
this, uh, this moving around the white space. And here is a sample result of the impact module, which uh, recognizes different Windows versions. And uh, the values that you see are the, the, the outputs of the neurons, which are more or less between 0 and 1. 1 means an active neuron. And we can see that the values for Windows 94 are almost 0, Windows 2000 almost 1. Between the different editions, uh, the server edition is 1, the others are almost 0. Same things happen with the service pack. And these are the values for the, the rest of the neurons. So here we can see that it was a Windows 2000 machine with server edition, service pack 1, with a very high probability because there was a, a big difference between the, the activation values and the non-activation values. And this is a result of the quality assurance lab. And uh, the old DCRPC module is a module which uses some kind of Hamming distance. And, uh, and the new ones uses neural networks no, to analyze the data. Uh, the perfect matches with uh, the self correct service pack in addition are increases in one, but partial matches increases uh, here. And which is uh, something that's good is that there are no mismatches. So this is a good improvement. And there were two machines that didn't match, well, they still didn't match. And uh, this was the, the first positive result that, that we obtained using neural networks. And that, uh, and that encouraged us to uh, continue uh, investigating that. Uh, because in the beginning, it's, uh, people were like a little bit uh, skeptical, saying, OK, neural network, it's cool. But uh, behind that cool factor, it's really a tool with good mathematical foundations, and uh, which is a, a convenient way to analyze data. No? Okay, so uh, now we're going to uh, talk about another module which uh, is based on the Nmap signatures and uh, which allows us to detect different operating system families. Uh, well, Nmap. I don't think I need to introduce it. Not an exploration tool, security scanner. And it does OS detection uh, by sending a series of packets to a host and studying the, the responses. Uh, the tests are called, are called T1 to T7, and there is a PU and TSEC test. And uh, well, it consists in sending, for example, T3 uh, TCP packets to an open TCP port with a combination of flag which is quite strange. So uh, we're going to see differences in the responses of the machine according to the operating system. Uh, so this method is, is based on the uh, signature database of Nmap. And uh, what is a signature? Well, it's simply uh, a set of rules describing how version and edition of an operating system will respond to the test. And uh, for example, for uh, here we have a Linux 2.6.0. And to the T3 test, it means that uh, the server is going to respond. The DOM fragment flag will be yes. The window size will be zero, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are rules because, well, most of the value are contents. But for example, the GCD of all the initial sequence number is uh, less or equal than six. We don't know exactly the value. And uh, I don't know, same thing happens here. Um, so uh, these are basically constant value, but also intervals of values. And uh, well, the Nmap database contains a lot of signatures. The last time that we counted them it was uh, 1,684. And uh, I think the only way to obtain such a big database is doing it as an open source project. But I think it's very difficult for a private research team to gather uh, such an amount of information. And uh, so the Nmap database is really a good uh, source of information. And the way it works is by comparing the response of a host to each signature in the database. 
and uh, Twix signature, it assigns a score, which uh, is a simple count. It's simply the, the number of rules that matches divided by the number of considered rules. Uh, so this is some kind of best fit, we can say, based on the humming distance, because all the rules uh, have the same weight in, uh, into, this, into this score. And the problem arises with improbable operating systems. No, because uh, some operating system will generate less responses to the test. So when we divide here by a smaller number, we obtain a higher value. And uh, that's why some exotic operating systems that are on the database uh, appear. For example, maybe uh, you send uh, the test to a Windows 2000 and uh, between the guesses of Nmap appears Atari or HPUX or something like that. Uh, so this was one of the things that we want to avoid. So I'm going to show with a symbolic picture the, the idea of what we did. Uh, imagine this represents uh, the responses of host to the test of Nmap. Um, this is a space of 560 dimensions. Uh, we're going to explain uh, later why the, this number. And uh, the colors represent different operating system uh, families. So uh, maybe, uh, yes, this drawing is just in two dimensions. So maybe it seems like a live thing. This represents 560 dimensions, but it's the invention of mathematics. No, once you get the concept in two dimensions, in 500 dimensions, it, it will be the same. And uh, the first step uh, to simplify the, the picture is to filter the, the, the operating system, which are not relevant for us. And um, since we are thinking the voice detection as a step of, the, of a pen test, we only want to detect uh, machines for which we have exploits. No? So in the case of impact, it's Windows, Linux, Solaris, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and now macOS. No? We should add macOS soon. And, uh, well, in this cloud of points, no, there are, are structures between the, the different families. So, if we can separate the different operating system families, then we can refine the analysis between each smaller cloud and uh, between this uh, cloud of only, opera, for example, here, OpenBSD system, try to, to guess the version. Uh, so, that was the idea, and Javier is going to explain now how to do that. Thank you. Well, to implement this, we use some technique used for imaging uh, processing, which is called hierarchical network structure. The idea is to apply the data first to a neural network, and then determine if the data is relevant or not. Once we know that it belongs to a relevant operating system, we apply the same data to other neural network to determine which family of the operating system is. Once we know the family, we can use other neural network to determine the operating system version. So we have five neural networks, and each neural network requires special design, topology, special design and training, which took a lot of time. So. Other thing to do is to map the information and map give us to something useful for the neural network. So sometimes it's kind of straightforward because we have an integer, so we can put an integer into the neural neural network and it will work. But other time we have flags, so we have to add one neural network for the presence of the, flag, of the flag and other neural network for each possible state. In this case, so here we are showing some example, some sample response from a Linux 2.6 and the mapping. For instance, the acknowledgement is present, so we have a one there. And the value is S++, so the S++ neuron is active. Well, this will give us a network with 560 dimensions in the input layer. 
that will give us a lot of redundancy, which is good because it will work if there are small changes in the data. But also, it, it will take a lot to train this network. So we really need some kind of dimension reduction. So, dimension reduction and training. Uh, well, as Javier said, we have been generous now with the input, and uh, we also have the problem that the data set is very big, so the, the training conversions uh, gets very slow, and uh, in fact the problem is worse because sometimes it doesn't converge at all. No, the, um, there is something that uh, the people who work in artificial intelligence call the curse of high dimensions. They don't know exactly why, but with high dimensions, things start to get broken and not work anymore. So uh, it's very important to try to reduce the number of dimensions, and there are lots of techniques to do that. Uh, and uh, these are techniques that apply on the input data. You know? uh, so, well, the first step for us was to consider the, the input dimensions as uh, random variables, and uh, those variables uh, take values with different orders of magnitude. You know, there are lots of flags which take one or minus one values, but uh, also the initial sequence number can be any integer. So mixing those values uh, is not very good. It's better to normalize, uh, subtract the expected value, and divide by the standard deviation. So all the values will be between more or less uh, minus one and one. Uh, then we compute the, the correlation matrix. Well, the, the formula is here. The, since the variables are normalized, it's simply this, the expected value of the product of the, the variables. And, uh, well, I don't know if uh, you know what the correlation means. Maybe it's going to bring you some bad memories of university. It's uh, when two variables are independent, the correlation is zero. And when the correlation is closer to one or minus one, it indicates uh, higher dependence. And, uh, and this matrix R has also, has also a very good property, which is that the linear dependent columns indicate uh, values which are directly linear dependent. So we can apply any standard linear algebra tool, for example, uh, Mathematica, or uh, which one did you use? MATLAB, no? And uh, I find the, those columns, and we just keep one because the others will be a linear combination. Uh, the same value or the sum of two values, something like that. And at these steps, uh, we find that uh, the constants which have zero variance are also eliminated. And uh, this is the, the result of this analysis uh, in the example of the OpenBSD family. That is, we applied to, uh, to this analysis for a data set containing open, only open BSDs and uh, to see which fields will remain, no? And, uh, for example, the test T1, the only thing that can vary between different open BSD is the window size and the first two options and all the other values are constant. Uh, in the test T3, we can see that there may be, uh, not be a response, but if there is a response, uh, don Feldman flag will be no, ACK will have those values, and again, the only thing that can vary is the window size and these two options. And uh, another interesting thing here is the test D5, which doesn't give us any information in the case of OpenBSDs, because uh, all the OpenBSDs uh, reply in exactly the same way. And this is the, the complete list of the remaining fields. Uh, you can see that the original indexes go up to 516, and these are the only ones that remain. Um, the test T5 doesn't appear, as we had said, and the text TSEC uh, conserves a lot of values. So this is a, another result uh, that we can uh, extract. That's, uh, all those tests give us more or less the same information as simply the TSEC test if we are going to distinguish OpenBSD versions. So if we already know that the machine is on an OpenBSD and want to refine uh, the version detection, we should start with this one 
and probably give us enough information. Ah, okay, this is another technique that Javier is going to explain. Yes, well, another way to reduce the dimension is to use principal component analysis. And the idea is to create a new basis for the correlation metrics well, for the input data. And to do so, we compute the eigenvalues and eigenvector of the correlation metrics. We sort the eigenvalues and we keep key eigenvalues, the key highest eigenvalues. Uh, we create this new basis using the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalues. Well, we want not to lose data, so we can choose the value key, so we can guarantee that 98% at least of the total variance is kept in the new basis. Uh, well, the idea is like we, we have two dimensions here, and if we only kept the horizontal axis, we are still getting some information. We can determine more or less the point if we only have the horizontal axis. But if we kept only the vertical axis, we don't know which point is. So well, the same idea is applied to a higher to a higher dimension. Well, after performing the two dimension reduction process, we have this new topology. Uh, for instance, the Solaris has only 26 neurons in the input layer, and it started with 560, which is a really good improvement. Other strategy to speed up the process is to use adaptive learning right. Well, the idea is to compute the quadratic estimate of the error, which use the expected output and the actual actual output. Then if we are getting a smaller quadratic error, we are in the right direction, so we want to learn faster, and we increase the learning rate. Uh, here is a plot of the quadratic error. We are using fixed learning rate, so we see that the conversion is slow. There are few peaks because we are using a stochastic process. It's normal. And here, well, well, here we are using adaptive learning, right? We can see that all the chaos is in the beginning of the process, and then the conversion is very fast and keep very low. Well, we run this model against a Solaris machine. The numbers are the output of the new the network. So, the neuron is active when it's close to one, and it's not active when it's close to minus one. Uh, we run, we pass the data to the first network, and we have almost one, so the operating system is relevant. Then we use the second network, and we we see that only the neuron corresponding to, to Solaris is active. So we have a Solaris. We can use the third network to detect which kind of Solaris is. And we see that it's a Solaris aid, so it works. And finally, we are, he will talk about new experiment with Kronos. Um. Okay, the, I'll explain you the idea of Kronos, which uh, is an OS detection tool, not very well known. It's a tool made by Olivier Courté, Olivier Hill, and Franck Besset, and they have implemented it as an extension of Nmap, called Nmap Kronos, that you can download, download from the website. And um, well, to explain the idea, I have here the, the drawing of the normal freeway handshake, not the servers, begins in the listen state, when he received the first scene, uh, it passed to scene receive state, sends uh, the scene ACK to the client. When the client sends the scene, the, the ACK, the connection is established. And uh, well, what happens if the client uh, doesn't reply to the scene ACK? Uh, the, uh, the RFC says that uh, it can be due to uh, congestion so the server will retry to send the CNACK 
and uh, it will retry several times uh, with uh, different delays between retries. And those delays uh, augment, it's more or less the double each time, not to provoke no more conjecture. And uh, so this is uh, the test is to interrupt the three-way handshake to simulate congestion and to uh, measure the, the number of retries and the delays between the, the retries. And the fun part of it is that it's inflammation dependent. This was the, the first test. There is another one which is similar, uh, but uh, when the, the client sends the the feed to close the connection and uh, the server sends the ACK feed. Again, the client uh, simulates congestion, doesn't reply, and the servers send several times the, the fin packet with different delays. So this one is called lost ACK because it's the name of the state where, uh, in which we keep the server. And these are uh, some examples. Well, one, pr one problem with the Kronos database is that it's very small, no? it's more or less a proof of concept, and uh, they have like 15 signatures, so which is very small. So these are results from uh, our laboratory, and uh, here we have two Linux machines, and we can see that uh, in the same test, the windows tried two times to, uh, to send the, the packets, and uh, the delays are, are measured in microseconds, so this is three seconds and then six seconds. And almost the same thing happened with the Windows 2000. And uh, the interesting part is that all the other operating system will have three retries to the same test. So when we only measure two, uh, two retries, we are almost sure that it's a Windows machine. Here is another good example of MacOS, where uh, we also have the response to another test, which is called fin weight, and which is uh, a little bit harder to obtain because um, we have to force the server to close the connection. And uh, in the case of MacOS, well, they, he retries three times for this test, and uh, four times for fin weight, and four times for lost ACK. And this is also characteristic of the Macintosh operating system. And this is another uh, easy, easy to recognize example, the, the Linux kernel 2.4. No, it can be any edition, Red Hat, Mandrake, or others. And to the last ACK uh, test, the, this Linux kernel version retries seven times. Whereas the, the previous one only retries three times. And uh, it's the only one that we saw retrying seven times. No? So this is another easy to, uh, to recognize uh, response. So what are the advantages of this method? Uh, the scene test only sends one packet and then wait for the replies. Uh, so in terms of uh, noise produced and, uh, and traffic generated, it's good. Uh, the last ACK test also only sends three packets. Uh, so this is a test that we may want to use if we don't care about time because it's slower than the usual Nmap test. No, we have to wait like 30 seconds for all the retries. But if we want to minimize traffic, uh, it's an option. And uh, another scenario where it works fine is uh, when there is a scene relay between the, the client and the server. In that case, the, the scene relay will handle the, the first three-way handshake once the connection is established with the client, it will establish the, effectively the connection with the server here. And after that, well, the connection is directly established between client and server. And the scene relay will let the packets uh, sent by the server pass directly to the client. Uh, so in this scenario, and the, the Nmap test uh, will probably uh, get the fingerprint of the scene relay whereas the last ACK test will measure the response of the server effectively. So here it, it works better. And uh, well, this is the, the topology for, uh, for this test. We have 26 neurons in the input layer. The value of, uh, of the input neurons are simply the number of retries and the delays between retries. So if we sum all the possible delays uh, for the three tests of Kronos, it gives us 26. 
Um, there are six neurons in the output. We are going to recognize six operating system families. And this 16 is just trying different value, the ones which work best. And uh, uh, this test, we made it with a, with a library called Fast Artificial Neural Network. And uh, the advantage is that if you want to try something quickly, uh, the training is three lines of code just invoking the standard training of the library. And these are the, the results we, we had uh, here, IX, Linux, MacOS, Solaris, and Windows machines. And uh, we got perfect match for all of them, except Solaris, which didn't match at all. And, uh, well, that was the, the result of the experiment. If we only want to uh, recognize the, the family, the information given by Kronos may be sufficient. And uh, after that, we can use other tests to refine the, the version. If we find that it's a Linux, use the DCRPC. If we find that it's a Windows, uh, if we find that it's a Windows, use DCRPC. And for the others, we have the, the unmap test. Um, well, that's uh, more or less all. Thank you for your attention. And other questions? Is that publicly available? Um, the, the two models that we first described, no, the DCRPC, are uh, included in uh, Impact, which is commercial. And uh, so, what uh, we plan to, to make available is uh, the, the, the code that we use during the, the research. So, uh, ah, I have here the, our contact information. So, please write us. Can give you a card and give it to you. Another question? Oh, thank you.